Well, as you know, we've been going through a study in the book of Revelation. We've been uh, focusing a lot on the different times where we see where God expresses his love by another pause in a moment. But then we uh, started a couple weeks back as we are continuing, we started talking about the bowls of wrath. Now, we know that this is actually the last of the coming plague and the just uh, and righteousness of God's anger being poured out upon the world. Now, I know that if you are not right with God, sometimes these things seem real harsh and a, of a critical God, but we need to remember, no matter what we read in this book, we know that God God has offered opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Even all the way up to this point, we see even during the time of the plagues and the different things going on, we see God offering opportunity to be saved. So for us to sit back and judge God as, as aggressive or mean or hateful or spiteful is completely wrong and inaccurate because he has been expressing nothing but love to us for how many generations of time and continues to, even in the future, we see how God expressed love. But as we shared last time, we talked about some of the bowls, and the bowls that started out, the first bowl, we know it was the plague that was upon man, that festering sores and wounds became uh, on the people. The second bowl that's poured out brought a plague upon the seas and turned it into blood. The third bowl was upon the rivers and the springs. So basically what you see is the completeness of God's anger and wrath. Everything which God has created is now being plagued upon because earth earth and all the rulers of the earth have come up into authority, a false sense of authority. And then the fourth bowl that where we stopped last uh, time was poured out in the sun and the sun that was allowed to scorch the earth. We see all this going on. And we took a break at that point because I wanted to come into the next section because we start to see uh, the final steps. Um, the two final bowls that will come out, um, we will cover a lot of material tonight. Um, as a matter of fact, we're probably going to go from 16 and end up over near 19 by the time we get through the story. But don't worry, we're not going to read it all, okay? So we're not going to go through verse by verse. And some people said amen. So anyway, so that's the picture that we're at. Right now, the plagues of man, the plagues on the ocean, the plagues on the river, the plagues in the sun, and the earth being scorched up is where we're at at this point in time. And it said the fifth angel poured out the bowl on the thrones of the beast, and the kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anger and agony and cursed God of heaven because of the pains of their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. Now, again, we see if people, you know, Scripture's talking about people refusing to repent. So it has to tell us, again, that there is the opportunity of repentance at this point. But they are, because they're sitting here now, I don't know about you, I know some stubborn people in my life, including me. Okay? But there is a line of stubbornness that even these people I can't understand. They're literally seeing the, de the demise of the world they know, the detriments, even to the point of the plagues being upon themselves, that they're literally gnawing their tongues in pain and agony, and yet they still curse God. I, I, maybe I'm, I mean, because maybe I'm a Christian now or whatever, I can't understand that concept, that even in the midst of all of this, they choose to curse God. It's almost like those that have struggles in life and they look and they blame God. Maybe that's a common denominator. But anyways, the fifth angel poured out and the people in the kingdoms in the darkness, people in all their tongues, so this continuation of the wrath of God. The sixth angel poured out his bowl in the great river Euphrates and its waters was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now this would kind of seem weird at first. Because as you read it, it just simply says, okay, what, they poured a ball out, it dried up the land, the, the water. But it was in preparation for what's next. See, there's a, there's a town at the time was known as Babylon. And now at the time that this was written, John, Babylon was already kind of self-destructed in its own. 
It still exists even today. It's actually in, uh, it's over in Afghanistan area. It's just south, it's in, uh, I don't know exactly where, about 50, 60 miles from Afghanistan, some over. But it's not as much as it used to be. It lies in ruins. But even in the Old Testament, it talked, um, Jeremiah talked about it. It talked about this destruction of Babylon. Now, how many realize in your studies that you found that Babylon was actually the home of the Tower of Babel? It was the same location. A time when man actually rose up to think that they could raise themselves to a level of God. And, of course, we know the story that at that time God said, wait a minute, not going to happen. And he struck them all to speak in different languages, and they could not understand each other. They grew frustrated. But the, ta- the system and the idea of the town of Babylon was a great and mighty city. It was one of the highest and most powerful areas in that whole region. It was something, I want to say, around 1720 B.C. It was at the height of its existence. People knew Babylon because that's where all the trade, that's where all of society was finding everything. It was a place that was of high status. As a matter of fact, it was a place that brought temptation from the Jewish people. They were tempted to go to Babylon and then tempted to live a life separated from God. Now, I'm talking about a physical place right now. But what we're about to hear about is uh, more of a, a spiritual side of things. See, the physical place, like I said, through the many different kings and the rulers at the time, Babylon actually became destroyed. As a matter of fact, the time that this was written, Babylon would have been just a few tenths of existence. This once mighty and powerful uh, existence was literally destroyed. It came to the ground, and then little has existed since. But all of a sudden, the sixth angel, I share that because the sixth angel comes in and clears the way. What we are starting to see is the introduction of the Battle of Armageddon. We've heard about this, we've seen stories about it, we've seen movies produced about it, but what we see is literally the beginning of a battle of good and evil. And so what's being taught about, now this is where we're going to kind of, I'm going to share a little bit more scripture here. The sixth angel poured out the bowl the great, on the great river Euphrates, and the water dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. So what we have here, sides being drawn. The lines in the sand are being set, set up. These, uh, the, the false prophets, you know, we know that there's a false prophet, we know the Antichrist, and we know the devil himself. There's a, a battle going on right now, and they send out to draw all the kings of the earth. Remember we talked about the ten horns? At one of the beasts that had ten horns, there'll be ten kingdoms that'll come together and unite together under this battle, under the flag of the enemy. They're coming together at this point. And so what we see is a line being drawn in the sand. And it talks about this battle, the great day of our God Almighty. Verse 16 says, and this is what's beautiful. This is actually written in red. And as you know, if you know anything about Scripture, anything that's written in red is the words of Christ and the words of a promise that's given to us. When he says, look, I come like a thief. Blessed are one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Now I want to throw an idea to you. What was the first sin that came to be? When Adam and Eve realized that they were naked, right? And they were ashamed. And right now you see Christ reminding us in the end times, listen, I'm coming to restore all things back to the way I created it. I'm coming to bring hope to a world that was lost. The sin entered in and now it's going to exit out. The greatest joy we have is right here in the simple term. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed are the ones who stay away. Guess what, folks? If we stay on track with God, then we are a blessed people. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I, sometimes there's a point where we just need to understand. 
Do we really believe that we're a blessed people? When we stop and think about this, if we stay in the arms of God and we persevere, we keep, as I like to say, keep on keeping on, we are a blessed people. Now, the part of this that we need to be careful of is that first part. Look, I come like a thief. We don't know when this will take place. Matter of fact, we don't know when we're going to take our last breath on this earth. We don't know the moment that God is going to come and the, re the resurrection is going to take place. We don't know. So what it means is that we have to live a life prepared and ready at all times. Right? And if we live that life, then we are blessed because we have stayed awake and remained clothed as not we have kept ourselves from sin. You guys get me here? The beautiful part of what our denomination and what our, our church preaches is an idea and a concept of holiness. Preparing and equipping ourselves and keeping ourselves from sin. That is an exciting part of this entire book right here. Because what follows is the great destruction of what everyone knows today as sin. The great destruction of all things that are not of God. Then they gathered the kings together in a place that is the Hebrews called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out the bowl in the air and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying it's done. He's going to come like a thief. And in a moment it is done. Now like I said when I started, if you're not right with God, this should terrify you. Because we don't know. And I know I'm preaching to the Sunday night crowd. I know I am. That's the joy of this. But I still make this statement. He's going to come like a thief. And in a moment of time, it'll be done. So it says it is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumbling, peals of thunder, and severe earthquake. No earthquake like has ever occurred since mankind has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts. And the cities of nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of the wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstorms, each weighing about 100 pounds. You think you've ever seen hail before? A hailstone as high as 100 pounds. Just think about that for a minute. Fell on the people and they cursed God once again. They cursed God on account of the plagues of hail because the plagues was so terrible. We see something right here starting. Armageddon's kicking in. The great battle. Now, there's one thing that has to take place. The lines are drawn. And now I talked about the physical city of Babylon. I talked about how it represented the great and mighty and powerful. It represented all the curse and everything of that nature of that time. It represented all the sin of people. Remember, the Tower of Babel was actually one of the greatest sins of mankind because they tried to raise themselves up to be God. And God struck them down. The representation of the Tower of Babel is brought into the mind of God. And God said, and this is what's so beautiful about this, about that cup of God's wrath. He said, I didn't forget about you guys. I didn't forget about the sin. See, there's a lot of things that are covered in this. It talks about the Babylon, the prostitute on the beast. It talked about a false god. See, the beautiful part of it, we are the bride of Christ. And he wants his bride pure. Right? Right? But so why does he use the prostitute on the beast? Because there's coming a time of a one world religion where we're going to begin to worship a false god. They're going to begin to worship something other than the one true God. Now I know over generations that we have heard different stories. Some people thought it was going to be the Roman Empire. Some people thought it was going to be the Catholic Church. Some people thought it was going to be Islam. We don't know. But there will be a false church. And it will become known as a one world religion. 
everyone will begin to serve. And we're, no, not everyone. The world will try to deceive us away from God. And they'll begin to false worship a false God. But what's so interesting to me, if you begin to read now, this is where we're going to kind of jump 17 and 18. We're going to kind of go through the story because it gets really crazy here. But what happens is God begins to declare all the unrighteousness, all the, the sin, all the, the problems of Babylon. He begins to call out all these different things, the great prostitute. And he's declaring a separation from us as a church, the, the bride of Christ, pure and holy. And you know what? Then there's the prostitute. There's the true church, and then there's a the false church. And he talks about all this coming on. He's declaring all this because the lines are drawn in the sand. That we now are faced with this great trial. You know what's funny about this? If you ever read this part, you'll find that God actually doesn't destroy the false prostitute. You know what happens? The Antichrist survives a head wound, resurrects, and guess what? He becomes a god of his own and destroys the false church. It's interesting, isn't it? You can't make this stuff up. But what's happening here, God is saying, listen, there's a great false church that's rising up and God's telling us at this point listen I've not forgot about that I heard matter of fact it says that her sins have been so great that they literally mounted up into the heavens and God says I'm going to knock them out I'm going to deal with this so he begins to strike down. He begins to bring wrath upon her. He begins to bring fury of God upon this great entity at the time and he begins to destroy. The battle of Armageddon has begun. The trumpets have sound and the lines are drawn. The armies are beginning to rise up. And we'll find out later on a little bit. And the next time we get together that there's a God side of it. How many realize that there's a first resurrection and then a second? Hmm. Something to think about. But anyways, what we see here is the destruction of sin in the world. The great battle between good and evil. A great battle that exists, that God comes and says, I'm done, I'm tired, I'm over all of this sin. I come like a thief in the night, as many people say. I come like a thief. And let me tell you what, if you're not right, if you're not ready, it is done. Will be the most terrifying words you've ever heard. Because at that point, you've made your mind. You've made your decision. Matter of fact, the only thing after this that we're going to see is a thousand-year reign when God brings heaven to earth. There's no more chances. That scares me. That scares even me. I know I'm right with God. I know I'm saved. I, I'm sanctified. I'm, I'm a good person too. But let me tell you what. I know some people who aren't. And that brings fear to me. When you read about the prostitute of the beast, it talks about all the different things. The deception. It talked about the fornication. It talked about all the sins. Pretty much, if you read the next couple chapters, you'll read almost the existence of every type of sin that man can exist. And God said, I will not deal with that anymore. My wrath is just. I am justified in doing so, and he's going to pour it out upon the world. We see all the different things, the woes of Babylon. We see the layman over Babylon. Fallen, befallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons, a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk and maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her, exclusive, or her excessive luxuries. And you know what's going to happen? God's going to bring a revelation to show, and there's going to, she's going to fall. You know what, folks? The world's tempting. The temptation's out there. I, you know, I'll even say the world's beautiful sometimes. It's beautiful in the eyes of, of, of man. But let me tell you what. If it's away from God, it's the most vile thing you've ever seen. If you look at it through the eyes of God versus the eyes of man, 
I'm not saying all the world is heathens and we're going to all. But you know what, folks? We have to stand and live a life that is pleasing to God. We will be held accountable if we do not live right for God. Just simply say it is done. A moment in time. We also know when we stand before the judgment, we'll hear, job well done, my good and faithful servant. And then one cried out, did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not declare it? And he said, depart from me, for I knew you not. Folks, it's clear. The choice is ours. What will we do with it? Like I said, I'm jumping over a lot of material. If you look at even the Babylon judgment, even in the midst of that, God says, Get out of there. Run from there. Leave that way. Turn away. Matter of fact, it's in chapter 18, verse, verse 4 on. It goes, then I heard a voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. What do you see here? Once again, a call from God. He never stops. He never stops. In his righteousness and judgment, he, he's, always, he's right to do so. But even in the midst of this, he's crying out to his people. You know what, folks? We aren't we're not supposed to leave the world. We're, we're part of this world. But we're not in that world. We're not living in that world's way. We need to separate ourselves from that. Not like the Amish and run out and live in without electricity or anything of that nature. Boy, I don't know what I'd do without electricity. I tell you, whew, I couldn't handle it. But we are to try to reach the people there. We are to always, continuously. And until such time as God deems it is done, then we need to keep trying as hard as we can. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you once again, Lord, for your love and mercy. And Lord, as we read these stories in the wrath, Lord, we know that you are just in doing so. And Lord, I pray right now that if there's anybody that, Lord, that, don't, that doesn't know you, that it's a friend of mine or I'm not aware of, Lord, I pray that you would make them, bring them to my heart. And Lord, then give me the words and let your Holy Spirit begin to compel them. Lord, I pray that everyone I know would come to a real truth in you and come to a relationship with you. Father, I don't ever want to think that somebody missed because of me. I pray that you give me courage to speak. Give me wisdom of the words to say. And Lord, give me the passion to do it. Lord, I pray right now that as we go our separate ways, you would allow us this opportunity this week to share the good news with somebody. And Lord, we'll be obedient to do so. Now, Lord, go with us. Keep us safe this week, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.